Hello and welcome to the Comlex Instant Review Podcast. Today's topic is going to be stroke. What is the pathogenesis of stroke? Well, there's two types of strokes, a hemorrhagic stroke and an ischemic stroke. Hemorrhagic strokes are also called intracerebral strokes because they're caused by intracerebral hemorrhage. Most common mechanism here is hypertensive small vessel disease leading to aneurysm formation. An important characteristic to look for is intracranial vascular malformations and cerebral amyloid angiopathy that can lead to infarcts. Now this is characteristic of patients who have primary cerebral hemorrhage, which is a subtype of a hemorrhagic stroke. Another subtype of a hemorrhagic stroke is a perimesencephalic hemorrhage, and these are caused by the rupture of intracranial veins. Typically, there's no aneurysm seen on angiography in a perimesencephalic hemorrhage stroke. So, hemorrhagic strokes, there's two main types, a primary cerebral hemorrhage and a perimesencephalic hemorrhage as a pathogenesis for hemorrhagic strokes. The most common mechanism is hypertensive small vessel disease. The pericerebral hemorrhages have vascular malformations and aneurysm formations, whereas the perimesencephalic hemorrhages are caused by rupture of intracranial veins and there is typically no aneurysm seen. Another type of a stroke is ischemic stroke, caused by large artery atherosclerosis, cardioembolism such as uh, an embolus or a thrombus formation, any sort of a small vessel occlusion such as lacunar strokes, are all types of ischemic strokes. Patients who present with strokes have most often some risk factors which have led to the stroke. So in your physical and in your history, it's really important to rule out some of the important risk factors. The most common risk factors are metabolic conditions like type 2 diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, or impaired glucose tolerance. Patients can also have certain genetic factors or markers like high cholesterol or high CRP levels and electrolyte abnormalities. Any history of a TIA, transient ischemic attacks, or hypertension, or myocardial infarction, atrial fibrillation, and signs of left atrial enlargement are also risk factors for strokes. Women who present with oral contraceptive use Patients who have a cerebral white matter lesion on the MRI, patients with headaches, also patients who present with smoking, psychiatric conditions and excessive stress levels can all have possible risk factors for strokes. And important complications of strokes will include neurological complications such as swelling of the ischemic brain tissue, and that can lead to a mass effect. In addition, patients can have pneumonia, which is a leading complication of stroke and a really important cause of post-stroke mortality. There's cardiac complications such as an increased risk of cardiac complications with infarctions of right hemisphere. Patients also can have post-stroke depression and delirium are all important causes of stroke complications. So the chief concern in patients who present with strokes would be to look for signs of any focal neurological deficits and assess the severity of these deficits. Most important findings would include things such as dysarthria, that's difficulty with speech, hemiparesis, patients can have weaknesses in their arms, legs, as well as numbness, headaches, dizziness, all these are signs that should be concerning. On the history of present illness, you should look for signs of recent drug use, migraines. Also assess the time of onset to determine the appropriate administration of thrombolytics. And so the time of the stroke of the onset is when 
the patients were at their previous baseline or at a symptom-free state. If the patient cannot give you this information, then the time of onset is when the patient was last awake and when the patient was symptom-free. Also understand that the medication history, such as interruption of aspirin therapy use, has been associated with increased risk of ischemic strokes or a TIA. On physical exam, you should again focus on characteristics of focal neurological deficits, but the physical exam is really helpful in determining the patient's pathophysiology of the stroke. Is it hemorrhagic or ischemic? Patients who present with hemorrhagic stroke can have coma, neck stiffness, diastolic blood pressure elevations above 110, vomiting, seizures, and patients who have a hemorrhagic stroke with decreased probability will have a cervical bruit or a prior TIA. Keep in mind that these are just some clues to distinguish hemorrhagic from ischemic strokes and the definitive diagnosis requires neuroimaging such as a non-contrast uh, CT of the head or an MRI. Skin may show signs of jaundice, purpure, and petechiae. Patients will have carotid bruise, jugular vein distension, and a neurological exam should include the use of the NIH stroke scale which serves to assess the level of consciousness in patients by looking at the alertness, asking the patient to know the month and the patient's age, asking the patient to open and close eyes on command, looking for the best gaze, doing visual field testing and facial palsy testing, as well as looking for motor function of the arms and the legs. You also would like to rule out signs of limbataxia, sensory changes by pinprick and dysarthria, or language deficits. This NIH stroke scale is an extremely useful tool to determine the severity of the strokes in a patient. Well, how do you make the diagnosis of a stroke? First, you want to assess the acute or the stirring onset of a focal neurological deficit. You should look for the time of onset, rule out a TIA, and look for signs of confusion, aphasia, and then your next step would be to carry out a neuroimaging to confirm the diagnosis and to distinguish between an intracerebral or an ischemic stroke. You also would like to rule out hypertensive encephalopathy, for which you would do a T. You would want to um, check for signs of encephalopathy. You also would want to rule out other pathologies that mimic strokes, such as a postictal state in Todd's paralysis. Patients who have any sort of a toxic metabolic disturbance, and the most common here would be hypoglycemia. Brain tumors, syncope, presyncope, hypotension, looking for basal or type migraines, patients who have Parkinson's, dementia, all these are diagnoses you would want to first rule out before making diagnosis of a stroke. And according to the American Heart Association, the goal is to complete, evaluate the patient and decide the treatment within 60 minutes of the patient's arrival to the ER. So all patients should get a neurological exam, a non-contrast brain CT, blood glucose, serum electrolytes and renal functions, markers of cardiac ischemia, activated partial thromboplastin time, and oxygen saturation. Also, non-contrast CT is use useful. Please listen to our next podcast, which talks about the treatment of strokes.